lead us in a brief moment of church business. Mark. Good morning. This is my first time moderating a business meeting. I'm not sure how I ended up being on here, but uh, anyway, good morning. Uh, and before before we do the the, the special uh, meeting, uh, let's let's go to the Lord in, in in prayer this this morning. Lord, it's just good to, to be in your house uh, here at Versailles uh, Baptist this morning. Uh, thank you for for every everyone here, uh, and uh, just ask for your your spirit to. To, to be with us this morning and, and on into this this year of, uh, of transition here at at uh, BBC, Lord, I thank you, uh, thank you for the nominating committee and and, and the work uh, uh, they're doing to help uh, fill the, the spots in the church uh, uh, to be about uh, the different aspects of the of the business business we need to be about, Lord, and uh, and I thank you for those individuals. Uh, that are considering uh, taking on these positions that we're going to going to vote on this morning. I just uh, pray that uh, uh, you will just continue to uh, to bless us and uh, uh, create in us uh, just a, a wonderful uh, spirit of uh, unity and, and harmony and uh, uh, just cooperation in terms of uh, putting putting you first and uh, and always looking to looking to you. Uh, in terms of how we may uh, may best uh, bring honor and, and, and glory to you, and just 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 helps to do all this uh, in in, a, in in one accord, in, in Christian accord, as as, uh, as we go forward uh, this year, and then just uh, just help us all individually this morning to uh, just give us guidance in, in how we might uh, uh, vote on these uh, on these items. In Jesus' name, I pray. Okay, so we do have a, a special uh, business meeting this uh, morning to uh, to address uh, two items. If I can uh, address your attention to your bulletins, you should have a, an insert there with your with your ballot. Uh, and if you are a member and you do not have a ballot and need one, Joe has some uh, extras here, and he can uh, uh, give you uh, those. But uh, there are two items. Uh, first, uh, with uh, John's announced uh, re- recently announced. Uh, retirement at the end of the year. Our bylaws uh, state that uh, the nominating committee will uh, uh, recommend uh, individuals, five individuals, to serve on a pulpit committee. And so they have done that work, and you will see those uh, names uh, listed there. Amy Bailey, Cheryl Crow, Brian Ethington, J.M. Lane, and, and Steve Sparks. Uh, so that's the, the first item of business will be for you to, to mark your indication there uh, in favor of that reckon recommendation for those five individuals or not. Uh, and uh, the second uh, item that has uh, uh, come up uh, is uh, there, uh, the, we recently had a business meeting uh, approved uh, a motion to uh, uh, form a uh, committee to uh, accelerate our debt retirement. And so uh, these are the, the names below, uh, Jeff Pendleton, myself, Claudius Clark, Henry Carl, Julie Reams, Tim Back, Sandy Hester, Ray Hester, and Mark Parrott uh, that would, uh, would form that committee to, to look at ways that we might uh, accelerate our, uh, our mortgage uh, debt retirement. Um, so if you will uh, just look that over and indicate uh, your preference on that, and then just pass them towards the uh, the center out. Yes. It's Mark here. <laughs> Okay, so so Mark has declined to, to serve on that committee. <laughs> yeah, so if you're going to vote no because Mark was on there, <laughs> take that into consideration. <laughs> Funny Joe. Okay, so yeah, just please pass to the, the center aisles and uh, uh, we'll, we'll collect those ballots. Okay. All right, thank you.
everybody have a chance to vote. Okay, thank you. I think that concludes our meeting. our North American Missions Month, and we want to always remember that God is in control of all things, and we have that opportunity to partner with Him, but He is also here in our presence this morning. He is also the God of our city. So let's stand this morning and let's sing about that great, great God that we have the privilege to know. God of this city, you're the king of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in the darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are, there is no to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. And greater things are yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of this city. You're the king of these people, you're the lord of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. There is no one like God.
and turn to 368. We have the privilege of serving not only a risen Savior, but a living Savior. And let's sing about that great truth this morning. Number 368. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Salvation to impart. You ask. 
thank you for it. You've sent your son to be our savior and Lord and he lives in our lives today. We thank you for the experiences of, of seeing your fingerprints all over our lives and the privilege to come together and rejoice today in that reality. Father, we thank you even for those days when, when your voice seems so still, when your presence seems uh, hard to discern we can trust you and know that you continue to work and do great things. We just come to celebrate who you are and praise you for being the God who reigns and lives in our lives today. Thank you for bringing these here to worship. Lord, you've, you've called us here this morning by, by uh, no accident. You have a message for each of us. And I just pray that you will open our hearts and make us sensitive to hear that word whether it's through a song, a, a word of, of scripture, the sermon, whatever it is, Lord, just touch us and allow us to hear and to respond with, with gladness and with boldness to your call to us even today. Thank you for the foremans, for the, the privilege to know uh, the people in Versailles, Missouri, and pray that you will continue to link our lives together as we seek to partner and, and work together for your glory. And Father, we thank you for those in service to the North American Mission Board, for Kay Bennett and many like her who serve in difficult places in our nation. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to pray for them, to give and to celebrate what you are doing through us in their ministry. Continue, Lord, to move in the spirit of uh, this service and allow us again just to, to rejoice and give you praise, our great God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see it, please. Uh, you will notice, I hope, uh, in your bulletin that we will be focusing, I hope today, if technology doesn't fail us, uh, on uh, the opportunity to, to hear about Kay Bennett. Kay works in New Orleans in a place where human trafficking is, is the, the rule. Baptist Friendship House offers, offers a safe place, a safe place for women and children to escape the hardships, the harsh realities of their lives and to find hope and assurance in Jesus Christ. This is the kind of ministry that we are privileged to sponsor as people who call, or call ourselves Baptist. So hear this uh, report, celebrate what God is doing, and then be generous, come prepared as you give to support the work of these people on the front lines of ministry even today. Let's watch.
great about New Orleans. It's a laid back city. To figure something, something. So if you never fit in anywhere in your life, you would fit in in New Orleans. New Orleans is light and dark, good and bad, beautiful and ugly. Let's all stand together for our offertory hymn, number 675 in your hymnal. Uh, we don't have the overhead working, so number 675, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we just want to recognize you as, as the one true God. You are Jehovah. Father, we, we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that you have for us, the son that you sent us for one say. Father, we want to lift up the, the families of our church who are in need of prayer, who face medical issues, they might face financial issues, employment, personal, just many things. We lift those families up, Father. Father, we just pray for you. Father, we pray for this church as it seeks out in, uh, opportunities in the community for mission work and around this state and around this world. Father, we pray for those who go. We thank you for those, the opportunity to go. We pray that uh, you'll bless that activity. Father, we uh, just pray that you'll be with us during the rest of this service. May our hearts and minds be open to hear your word. And Father, as we go out this week, may all the things that we do and say be your honor and glory. So, Father, we, uh, as we take up this, this offering, we just ask you to bless these, uh, bless these tithes and offering that uh, it will be used to, to do your work. So, Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name.
in there, man. Hey, I, I'm, I want to tell you something that, man, we showed up this morning uh, with our computer systems completely down. And, uh, you know, it has been the work of our media team to, to try to put up something. I want to tell you how grateful I am for them. I don't know if you're grateful, but you need to know how hard they work to make it happen. And here's, amen, yeah, here's why, here's why I believe things are haywire. Because any time Satan can, can sense or, or notice that God is going to do something big, he will do anything to distract the Holy Spirit. Anything. And I believe that's happening this morning. Amen? But here's what I believe. Is that there is nothing that can come against us than, that's stronger than the blood of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. Especially when it's a silly computer. <laughs> well, I'm grateful for you. Uh, being here this morning, you know, I know that uh, there's a lot of places that you could be But either that you were you chose to be here or were drug here I'm not sure why you're here But what I know is that God's got you here for a reason and I'd like to start out this morning with a preacher's joke Now uh, if you know the way I preach I don't use a lot of preachers jokes just because I don't get them uh, <laughs> and, and they typically they typically uh, you know, aren't very funny. But let me tell you why this preacher's joke is important to me. Is that this is one of the last emails I got from Paula Shea Johnson. She, um, she was just very dear to me. And I, and I was going through my email this week and I found this preacher's joke. So let me give you preacher's joke etiquette if I can, alright? I'm going to tell the joke. And then I'm going to do something called the punchline. Alright? And then what I need you to do is I need you to laugh. So let's practice. To Michael, <laughs> I wish y'all could hear Michael's laugh. Um, all right, I think you get it. Here we go. Uh, last emails I got from Paula Shea Johnson. Wonderful, opens up exactly what I feel like God is leading us to this morning. Billy Graham was returning to Charlotte after, it's already good, isn't it? Uh, after a speaking engagement, when his plane arrived, there was a limo there to transport him to his home. As he prepared to get into the limo, he stopped and he spoke to the driver. You know, he said, I'm 87 years old and I have never driven a limousine. Would you mind if I drove it for a while? The driver said, no problem, have at it. So Billy gets into the driver's seat and, and they head off. So down the highway, a short distance away, sat a rookie state trooper operating his first speed trap. The long black limo went by him doing 70 in a 55 mile an hour zone. The trooper pulled out and easily caught the limo. He got out of his patrol car to begin the procedure. The young trooper walked up to the driver's door and when the glass was rolled down, he was astonished to see who was driving. He immediately excused himself and went back to his car and he, he called his supervisor and he told the supervisor, I know we are supposed to um, enforce the law, but I also know that important people are given certain courtesies. I, I need to know what I should do because I've stopped a very important person. So the supervisor asked, is it the governor? The young trooper said, no, he's more important than that. So, the super, uh, so his supervisor said, oh, is it the president? And the young trooper said, no, he's even more important than that. So the supervisor finally asked, well then, who is it? The young trooper said, I think it's Jesus because he's got Billy Graham for a chauffeur. Hey, that's pretty good. What do you think? <laughs> Paul Lachey was the king of forwards, and I typically glanced over them. <laughs> but man, I read this one, and I thought it was funny. I, I don't care what you say. I thought it was, I thought it was good. And, and I want to tell you why this is so important to me. Because when we've come to the part in our series, this the cross at 30,000 feet, we've gotten to this point when this plane is starting to land in the timeline of faith. And what we find is that when Jesus comes to the earth, he does not come as many people expect him to come. In fact, when we uh, understand history and we understand God's word in context, many people were looking for Jesus to come in a limousine. Did you see how I connected that? But they were. They were expecting him to come in power. They were expecting him to come and rule. They were expecting him to come and to make everything right. But what they got was so very different. 
In fact, most of the Roman world had no clue that he had even come. Most people, it was an ordinary night, and a lot of people were home because they were, you know, coming for the census. Really, it's a really nice way to say they were coming to pay their taxes. Most people did not know. Now, last night, I know what it means to be in a limo. It was my brother's bachelor party last night, and so we had a big stretch Hummer limo. Um, Don't worry, we all chipped in for it. And uh, we pulled up to our dinner spot, P.F. Chang's. And uh, when we got out of the limo, there was, there was like uh, eight of us pulling out. And you could see everybody's faces like, wow, wow, they have a limo. You know, until I step out and almost trip. But they were like, wow. But you know, when people pull up in limos, they're, they're important, right? Like you, you, you think, except for us, uh, you know, you think that, that they mean something. Or, and, and really, you can rent a limo uh, for you know, the cost of a few years' wages, you know. (laughs) But most people thought Jesus would show up like that. But what we find in our our series right now is that Jesus showed up so differently. And here's the thing. My question to you this morning is, do you see him or have we missed it like the Roman world? You see, Jesus did not come on a blazing horse to take over government and to overthrow everything that was evil. No, Jesus came humbly in a manger born of two inconspicuous people. And so the point of this series is not to only look at the facts up close, but the point of this series is to prepare my heart and to prepare your heart for Easter. And to say this, let's not miss it. Because that's exactly where we're at. We're going to read a story today about a lot of people that missed it, but we're going to read more importantly about a few people who didn't miss it. And man, it made all the difference in the world to them. And I believe it'll make all the difference in the world to you. Let's pray. Father, we give you this time, and God, we just ask that you would be with us, uh, that God, your Holy Spirit would guide us. And Father, we just say, God, could you come in and just take over? Father, we are are people of fault. God, we are... Um, people who who don't always understand what you're calling us to do. But God, we know that you are the God of clarity. So I pray that for each person's life here. God, speak to each person as you would see fit. We love you. In your name, amen. See, where we're going to land today is we're going to land in kind of the first part of Luke. You can get your Bibles ready if you'd like. It's in Luke chapter 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to examine some people's reactions to Jesus when he first came. You see, here's the thing. A lot of people missed it, but there were some people who didn't miss it. And so from 30,000 feet is where I want to get up, and I want to see, man, what God was doing from 30,000 feet. Because often up close, like we've been talking about over the last few weeks, up close we miss it. But from 30,000 feet we see that God has not forgotten about us. He has not forgotten about you for a minute. And where we find is we find ourselves um, in this story in a world where a lot of people believe that God had forgotten about them. They were waiting on the Messiah. They were waiting on the Savior. And when he comes, he did not come with a loud boom. He came with a little cry. And so then it begged every person that would experience that, the question, what will you do with the birth of Jesus? And I think this morning we've all got the exact same question. What will you do with the birth of Jesus? In other words, what will be your reaction? Because in this world there is no reaction. There's not a thing called no reaction. We all will have a reaction. So if I can just encourage our hearts, I want to ask you the question, how have you reacted to the birth of Jesus in your life? You see, we react to a lot of things. You know, I, I will never forget, and if I've told you the story before, pretend like you've not heard it, uh, the first time that my wife would tell me some of the sweetest words I've ever heard. Well, we, had, uh, we were talking on AOL, uh, AOL Instant Messenger. Some of you know where that is. That's kind of like a web interface. You kind of chat back and forth, and there's some loud, annoying beeps and bongs and dings. And, and so that's, that's the way that we courted. And uh, after about two or three weeks, I mean, I was laying the game on heavy. I mean, heavy. I mean, I was pulling out every, everything I could pull out to try to woo this 
to watch, try to woo this girl. And so finally one day we're chatting on AOL Instant Messenger and she looks at me and she, and she looks at me. <laughs> she types to me, she goes, can I call you and talk about something more important? And, uh, and I said, oh man, she's going to tell me to back off. And so I said, sure. So she calls me on my dorm phone and, you know, because I had my roommate in the room, I, I obviously excused myself and, and I was like, hello. And she was like, that was beautiful voice, beautiful. Hey. That's not really how she sounded, but that's how I'm going to tell you she sounded. Uh, and she goes, um, I got Sunday, some Sunday to tell you something. And I'm thinking she's going to lower the hammer, right? And so she says, I don't know what, she goes, for some strange reason, and I am not sure why, but I am strangely attracted to you. <laughs> and so I had a decision to make. <laughs> it was the most beautiful words I had heard in, in my life, but then I had this other reaction, like, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, is it my stunning good looks or my charming personality or the way I carry my Bible? You know, I mean, what do you mean you don't know? So I had this, I had this, I had this kind of choice. How am I going to react to that? And here's how I reacted with dead silence. I was blown away. You'll have to ask my wife about it. She'll probably tell a different version of the story, but that, that's, that's how I remember it happening. And I, I remember that there was dead silence. Why? Because my reaction was astonishment that this beautiful girl would have anything to do with me. I mean, everything that happens in our life demands a reaction. And maybe you've had some reaction moments in your life. Maybe it was the time you saw your baby being born. And do you remember how you reacted when you saw your baby? You remember that reaction. Or maybe it was uh, your reaction to when your boss comes up and he says, you've got no promotion. Now, I'm not sure if anybody's ever walked through that. That's a, I don't know how you reacted with that. Or uh, maybe it was the time in school where you stood up to the school bully and you said, no, 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 that's not going to happen anymore in my school. And uh, maybe you remember your reaction to, to that. Or um, maybe it was the last moment when you walked out of work for the last time after many years of service to be retired and start a new way of life. And then, so all of those circumstances in our life like beg this reaction. And, and if you think about your life, our lives are like just one long series of reactions. And so my question is, is what is our reaction going to be to this baby? Because in the part of our story, it demands a reaction from every single one of us. And so I'm going to give you four reactions today. You're going to find them in your bulletin. I may or may not uh, have them on the screen here, but you, you'll just have to listen. So four reactions I think that we all have to make. Or four reactions that we all should consider making to this baby. Because how we react to it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, we're going to start uh, in Luke chapter to right here in verse 8. I want to introduce you to a couple of guys. I'm going to read it to you. Luke 2, chapter 8. It says this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields, in the fields uh, nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ. He is the Lord. Pause there. He was everything that they had been waiting for. Now, if you were a good first century Jew, you understood what it meant to be looking for the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, if an angel comes, and not just an angel, maybe it's even an army of angels comes and says, Hey, listen, the Christ is here. It demands a reaction, doesn't it? I mean, you can't just not have a reaction to that. And here's what it says. Um, this will be a sign to you. In verse 12, that you will find a baby wrapped in clothes, li cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared. In other words, that was called an angel army. Uh, with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom his favor rests. It was the best Christmas pageant ever put on. It was the first Christmas pageant put on. Now, now I want you to watch the reaction. It says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven... The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which this, the Lord has told us about. The first reaction I believe that you and I need to have when we start to look at God sending his son to the earth is we should act with urgency. 
Number one, we should act with urgency. You see, the shepherds acted with urgency. Now, a, a typical shepherd, uh, when they would go into their flocks, typically um, that season it would range from sort of, sort of April. Um, you know, it could have even gone to as late as maybe October. Now, uh, you know, typically on how we date Christmas, you know, there's some flex back and forth, but it's probably safe to say that these shepherds were kind of in kind of the waning days of this season of shepherding their flock. And if you know anything about a shepherd, there is nothing more important than their sheep that, or, or their livestock. That is the whole goal of them living, is that what they were doing. But man, when they hear that Jesus has come, the Messiah, the one that would come and save the world, they did not react with, I'm too busy. Do you know how they reacted? With urgency. Everybody say urgency. Urgency. They reacted with urgency. They dropped everything. And they were probably in the waning days. They said, man, let's get out of here and let's go see what this baby is all about. Folks, I believe that if we're going to be people whose hearts are prepared for Easter, people whose hearts are prepared for a very tough world, we need to understand that probably the first reaction that we could have and that we should have to Jesus is urgency. And I believe that's urgency in service and urgency in worship. There should be nothing, no schedule, no meeting, no appointment, no endeavor, no sports game, no anything that's more important than urgency. Nothing more important than coming and worshiping. I'm thinking, what would happen if there was a church, and I believe this is a church like that, who would say in this season and almost every season that, man, when we understand uh, who God is and we sense Him moving, that we're going to react with urgency just like the shepherds. I will never forget buying my first home, and you know who you are. First night in my new home, my water heater uh, busted. Some of you have experienced that. You just walk through the sloshy hallways. And so it was, it was the first night uh, in my new home that we had just purchased over in the village. And my heart was broken, because I mean, everything we had, we, we had went in, into, this, into this house. And, and so I didn't, I didn't know what to do. We're slopping up water before I come to worship. And so I come in into the church, and I'm, I'm just down, and I forgot who I mentioned it to. But I said, man, my water heater just, just busted. And so I went through my day here and kind of got through trying to figure out how I was going to scrape up some money to go, to go pay for this water heater. And all of a sudden, I forget how it all played out. Either somebody walked up to me or somebody told me, but a Sunday school class right here at this church took an offering and paid for my water heater before we could get out of worship. Not only did they do that, they found the person who was going to install it. And they said, he's coming over in a few minutes. I can't tell you how much that blessed me, church. That's people that act with urgency. I'm not Jesus. You don't need to act with urgency to me. But man, the urgency was, man, in light of who Jesus is, they felt like they needed to serve. And man, I can't tell you, that has stuck with me and my family, and we will never forget that. You see, when we are people of urgency because of what Jesus has done for us, because of Jesus coming, then that's a natural part of who we are, right? We act with urgency with people who have needs. And so my question is, is how urgent are you? Not only with service, but how urgent are you with worship? We've got to be people of urgency, but here is the issue. I think sometimes, if you're like me, this is true, urgency is blocked by commitment. Urgency is blocked by commitment. I have a previous commitment. I've got a commitment to go here. I've got a commitment to do this. There's nothing wrong with commitments. I think we should be people of commitment too. Let our yeses be yeses and our noes be noes. But here's the deal. The shepherds had a commitment to their livestock, but man, in light of Jesus, their commitments mean, meant nothing. And what would happen if God raised up an army here in Versailles of, of people who were urgent? I can't tell you how many people in this church that I've seen act that way. Not only that Sunday school class, but over and over and over, I see people acting with urgency, and it blesses me. You know why? Because when we begin to act with urgency in service and in worship, God comes in and he takes care of our commitments. 
I do not know of one instance, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, of someone who acted with urgency either in worship or in service and their commitments weren't taken care of. I can't tell you of one person who, who did that. Now, I have no clue what happened to the livestock of the shepherds. I, the, the story doesn't really say that, but here is, here is what my best guess is. God took care of those livestock. I mean, I can see a sheep raising up like, bah, I'll be the leader, you know? <laughs> stretch <laughs> you know and hey hey I got this y'all go do that you see when we act with urgency when we go and do whatever God's calling us to do and we drop everything when we feel like we need to worship and you know however that worship looks that I believe God takes care of our commitments at the first church I served at um, Every staff member had, had this priority we had to do every single month. We had to have like a sabbatical day. And it was where our, our, our pastor said, hey, you need to go and you just need to be with the Lord for an entire day. Don't take your cell phone. Just you, Bible, park, Wendy's, whatever. Just go, go, go do that. And, and so we acted with urgency and worship. And I can't, I, those weeks it seemed like I got more done than I've ever gotten done in my life. Why? Because when we act with urgency towards the cross, then I believe his strength and his power becomes our strength and our power. So one is, is urgency. But here's the second way I think that we should react. And we find it in Luke chapter 2, verses 22. I want to tell you about the second person who reacted. And his name was Simeon. Actually, we're going to uh, start here in, uh, in uh, 25. Luke 2, 25. It says this. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought him in, uh, excuse me, when the parents brought in the, in, uh, uh, in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light to the Gentiles and, and, and for glory to your people Israel, a revelation to the Gentiles. It says the child's father and mother marveled at that, at what was said about him. See, the, the second way that I think that God is calling you and I to react is, second thing, is fulfillment. Is fulfillment. Man, this Easter... Could Jesus be our fulfillment? He is all we need. You see, I, I love Simeon. It says that Simeon, every day, he worshipped in the temple court. So he was urgent as well, wasn't he? He, he had dropped everything to, to go in and to worship. And literally, all he needed in his life was not wealth or, or power or even companionship. Do you know what he needed? It says here that Simeon, all he needed to do was hold Jesus. That's it. Just experience him one time. And he said, man, if I can experience him one time, then he will be my portion. And could we be fulfilled by him this Easter? I don't know what each of your needs are, but here's what I know. God is capable of filling each one. He may never give you an abundance, but man, I believe God takes care of us. And I... I think, this is just what I think, I think true fulfillment comes when we don't find fulfillment in anything else but Him. Amen? Because I think when we hunger and thirst for other things than God, then there's, there's always like this pit. There's always this sort of hole in our soul that we can never get filled. And maybe you've felt this way. I've felt this way in my life. I've, I've tried to fill my life so much with, you know, companionship and friendships and vices and, you know, different kinds of addictions. And I got I to gotta be honest, church, is that nothing fulfills like a relationship with Jesus. And Simeon knew that. I mean, Jesus fulfills like going to the grocery store on a full stomach. Here's how I'm going to connect that. <laughs> when you go shopping, what's the one rule that everybody should follow? You eat before you shop, right? Who's ever been to the grocery store hungry? It is a disaster on your pocketbook. You're like, oh, double stuffed Oreos. I can see Michael going to the grocery store hungry, man. 
That would be awesome. Shredded cheese. Fruit Loops. <laughs> you see, when we go to the grocery store hungry, then what happens is that we buy into things that we really don't need. They don't really fulfill us. They just look good in the moment. But when we go to the grocery store filled, then we only go after what we need and what is necessary, right? I believe the same is true with our relationships with Jesus. If we walk through this life fulfilled by him, then the stuff of the world is not as attractive to us, is it? I mean, the vices and all the, the pitfalls that we tend to fall into, I believe when we're fulfilled by Jesus, that stuff is not as attractive. Co uh, extra companionship or money or, you know, fame, all that stuff is just a fades away when our fulfillment really is in Jesus. So this Easter, could you remember, don't go to the grocery store hungry. Go into this world fulfilled. Because when we go fulfilled, well, I don't think we fall into the pitfalls that often happen to us. Fulfilled, that's two. Simeon was full, fulfilled. But here is the third thing. It's in Luke chapter 2, verses 41. We find that Jesus has, has grown up a little bit. And, and so let me read to you what happens. Luke 2, 41. It says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. So they win parents of the year here. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began... Can I stop there? Has anybody ever gotten confused by that verse? I absolutely may ask Joseph and Mary in heaven, what were you thinking? You got the Savior of the planet! The universe, make sure he is with you. Maybe get one of those strange kid leashes. Have you seen the kid leashes? Don't do that, but that, that's weird. You know, like, like, I don't mind the kid leashes. I need one for Levi. But like, I, I, I want, okay, anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> when they did not find him, verse 45, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Here's the third way I think we ought to react. I think we ought to react with amazement. I think that's the third best reaction is we, uh, we react with amazement. Here's what the word amazement means. It means a feeling of great surprise and wonder. Now, here's the deal. I can imagine these people in the temple, not only uh, the teachers of the law and the priests, but just the general onlookers were amazed by this boy. About his understanding and, and his answers. And, you know, I don't know exactly how they, how, how they acted, but the word says is that people were astonished and, and they were amazed. And so I think our reaction has got to be the same way. Is that we should be astonished and amazed at Jesus. We should be filled with great wonder of him. I remember as a little boy, we would go to Cincinnati uh, to go to a Reds game. It was like the best, fam the, the best family vacation ever. We'd go to the Reds game in Kings Island. Loved it. Skip Florida. Because when we would go over that hill, and if you've been up North 75, Cincinnati, you go over the hill, and if you're an old school Reds fan, you remember Riverfront Stadium, don't you? And you went over the hill, and all of its glory was Riverfront Stadium. And like the heat was beaming down, and the smog was a perfect backdrop. It was beautiful. And I remember as a little boy, I still remember that amazement, that, that what, how the crack of the bat sounded when you walked in into Riverfront. I remember the smell of, of popcorn and Cracker Jacks. You know, I remember begging my dad for hot dogs, and I remember it being so excited because there were four levels of colored seats. Do you remember that? Blue, green, yellow, red. I, 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 don't, I don't know why I remember. I was, I was amazed, and I was in true wonder of Major League Baseball. I think we ought to have way more amazement over Jesus. That's what these people, when they encountered him, they were absolutely amazed. There's this lady named Susan. She works at Waffle House. 
you know me, I spend a lot of time there. Over the last four years, I have seen this transformation in Susan's life, and I gotta tell you, I don't, I don't know I'm, I don't know if I've contributed at all to it, but there's been a church who has reached out to Susan and her family. Um, and over the last four years, I've gotten to have multiple conversations about what that church is about. And just a couple of weeks ago, while she's serving me my bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, she says, Adam, I'm, I'm blown away about what God's doing. I said, what, what do you mean? She goes, you got to hear my girl talk. She goes, she's like a different girl. She loves the Lord. She carries her Bible around. She's encouraged me to take the, the K-Love 40-day challenge. I don't know if you've heard that. The, listen to nothing but K-Love for 40 days. And, you know, and she was like, I've done that, and I can't tell you how much peace I've had. And I sat there in amazement, not at Susan. I sat there in amazement of how God's ability to change hearts. We're in amazement because God's got the ability to change anybody's heart. And I don't know Susan's past. Well, I mean, I do. It, there's some rough parts. But what I know is that God's not done there, and He's working. And I know this for you, God's not done in your life. He has not forgotten about you. He loves you. Let Him amaze you with His love this Easter. Because that's what happened with the people in Temple Courts. The fourth thing is this. We find it a little bit down the road. In Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 20. This is the very last reaction I think we ought to have. 15 through 20. John is baptizing people. And Jesus comes up to him and here is how this plays out. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. You see, do you see how many people missed it? <laughs> they were still looking. John answered them, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chafe with unquenchable fire and with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news. Then listen here what happens in 21. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. So the fourth reaction I think that we ought to have is humility. It's humility in view of the cross. That may be the most important. You see, the people were coming to John. They were saying, you, you're it. You, you are the Christ. You know, we're going to put you in the Hall of Fame. And John says, hey, listen, I know you're impressed, but don't be impressed. Because there is one who is coming that I am not even worthy to tie his shoes. Humility is an appropriate reaction to what God's doing in our life. Where he becomes more and we become less. I, I love what C.S. Lewis says about humility. He says this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I love that. I love it. Humility is not defacing who God has created you and I to be, right? Because he's created us to be like him. And we never want to insult his creation. But I think real humility, real humility, and this is a great reaction, is to think about ourselves less and to think about others more. And man, this Easter, could we do that? Could we make it a point to think about other people less, especially, um, more, think about other people more, especially Jesus, and think about ourselves less? See, if people that think of themselves less are easy to spot. It's those people who serve without grumbling. It's those people that seek to get last in line for something. People that think of themselves less um, are, are people who continually push praise to the real source, God, yet are humbly gracious at the same time. I think people that are truly humble are people who know there's something better coming. And what a testimony we could have if we were just people that thought of ourselves less. I think that's a great reaction, don't you? And we'll close with this. My mom thought of herself less. 
you know, most of you know the story of that. I won't go back into that. But when she went to, to be with Jesus, my family had this incredibly tough task of cleaning out her closet, her drawers. And maybe some of you have had that task where you've had to clear out some things of one that you loved. I, I can't imagine how that feels. And when they were cleaning out my mother's undergarments, they struggled to find even one that didn't have holes or, or some kind of rip or tear. And they were wondering why. <laughs> why would she go around with under, uh, undergarments ripped and torn? And here's why. My grandma would tell me she would never buy anything for herself because she wanted Kyle and I to have the best of everything. My mom was somebody who thought of herself less. And she didn't do it because she wanted recognition. In fact, nobody ever knew. She never complained about it. She never went to my dad and said, Honey, I need to go and get some new Hanes. <laughs> that sounds weird, but whatever. <laughs> She thought of herself less. She put us first. I think that's what people who are going after the cross do. They're, they're humble. They think of themselves less. Because here's what happens. Just like in fulfillment and urgency, when we think of ourselves less, God never forgets about us and our needs. I love what James 4.10 says. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord do you know it? And he will lift you up. Can you say that with me? Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I got to tell you, I want the creator of the universe to lift me up. And so as we go towards Easter, and could we think about our reactions to this child? Could we act with urgency? Could we be fulfilled? Could we have amazement and wonder beyond our imagination? And could we even most of all be humble and think of ourselves less? And here's why. It's because when we, when we act in these ways, the God of the universe lifts us up and fulfills every need. I don't know what needs you've come in here with this morning. I don't know your hurts. I don't know. I did not care deeply about his one and only son for you. And because he sent his one and only son for you, you can be fulfilled, you can be amazed, and you can react with humility and, and urgency. Because God sent his son for you, you don't have to worry about the penalty for your sins. All you have to worry about, you don't have to worry about it. All you have to look for is opportunities to, to share him. You see, God reacted to sin by sending Jesus. How will you and I react to Jesus? Let's pray. God, we're grateful and we love you. Father, I thank you for time just to unpack your word. And so I pray, um, God, that you would always be the one that fulfills us. God, there's nothing more important than you. God, I pray that um, if there's someone here whose heartstrings are tugging, that, God, that um, you would propel them forward, that you would help us to do some heart surgery this Easter. And, and God, look at the way that we're reacting and act on it. Father, we love you so much. And we're so grateful for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, if, if you want to, to, to know more about how God reacted for you, if you would love to know more about what it means, man, to be his, man, we would love to talk to you about it. No strings attached. If you want to be a part of a church that's, you know, that's banding together to act with urgency. We would love for you to be a part of our family. If you just want somebody to pray for you, we're going to be here. So as we stand and as we sing. It's number, 480, number 489 in your hymnal.
pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me Thy throne of mercy, find a sweet relief, kneeling there in deep contrition, help my I'm grateful for you, and hey, I'm just wanting you to know this, that, that, that maybe coming to the front scares you to death. I got to tell you, I get scared to death coming to the front, too. I'm just a good faker. And so if, if you ever want to talk about what that means, we would love to have the opportunity to chat with you. We're going to be in the lobbies. You can come see us in the office. Just bring snacks. Uh, we would love uh, to spend time hanging out with you. Thanks so much for sharing this morning as uh, we've been going on this series, The Cross from 30,000 Feet. We've been speaking of Jesus' coming, and today we've heard that he did, in fact, come. Hope you'll join us again next week. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 22, if you want to go on and read ahead. Uh, this idea of connecting what we spoke about at the very beginning of our series, the Garden of Eden with the Garden of Gethsemane, the tale of two gardens. I hope you'll join us again next week for that. After church today, remember we're having a special lunch to benefit our Mexico uh, mission trip. I hope you'll stay. Everyone is invited to stay. We have plenty of food. I hope you'll uh, uh, rejoice in staying with us in that. Also come tonight at 6 o'clock because our Mexico team will be sharing about their experiences. We're very blessed this morning to have uh, Todd and Kim Foreman with us. Uh, Todd is the pastor at First Baptist Church in Versailles, Missouri. You may remember he and a group from their church came to visit with us in November. And uh, they are celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary this weekend. And uh, they have chosen to spend that anniversary time with us. So I hope you'll greet them uh, today as uh, we leave this service time. Also, our flowers, Claudice asked me to announce... Um, uh, our Easter flowers, if you would like to order flowers for the special Easter service, those orders will be placed this week at the, in the church office. You can call the church office and make your order for Easter flowers, but those need to be in by Friday of this week. John? 
yesterday I had the opportunity to uh, greet one of my neighbors out in the backyard, and uh, the conversation turned around to the, the Bible being presented on the History Channel. And um, I engaged him a minute about that, uh, and it just seemed like an opportunity the Lord has provided uh, to use a, a presentation uh, through uh, media uh, of Scripture that will give me an opportunity to relate to him. So I hope you'll look for that opportunity too. Uh, many of you have opportunities to uh, record uh, programs. You might want to record that series, watch it with some neighbors, talk about it, uh, just use it as a chance to share uh, how the Bible has impacted your life and what that means to you. Uh, one of our members came in this morning and was just, he was just exuberant. He shared how he had been on an opportunity to, to, to reach out to people and had out the privilege of reaching four people to make commitments for Jesus Christ during that time. He said, you know, it was nothing like it, John. I just shared my story and watched God work. And, and that's, that's the privilege that we all have, the privilege that we have to share what Jesus means to us, as Adam was saying, and then invite people to respond in that way. Our eighth hunt uh, Saturday involves our puppet team, so if you want to be here at 10 o'clock for that uh, uh, Saturday, the puppets will be sharing uh, in that time, and we look forward to them being able to be a part of that ministry uh, with our kids together. Anna White has several folks here with her today, and we are delighted all of you all can be here. And I think one of her daughters, granddaughters, Lindsay, I haven't met, is there a Lindsay here? Lindsay, great, Lindsay. I understand you've just finished uh, Marine uh, Basic and will be going to further training. Is that close to right? It is, good. We just are grateful for that. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I was just uh, excited to hear that and uh, your commitment to our country and to training and uh, as well as your sister and all the family that are here. Anna packed a pew almost today. Of course, Anna packs a Sunday school class every week. Uh, we are uh, privileged to have her as a part of our, our church family. And uh, Lindsay, I'd just like to, for us just to share a brief prayer for you as you go and take on this new venture. Would that be okay? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our service today and the chance to uh, celebrate your love and, and your coming to uh, reveal yourself to us. Thank you for that good news. And thank you that uh, Lindsay's been able to be a part of uh, this service along with a lot of her family. I thank you for the experiences she's had in these past weeks as she sets out on this uh, career path. And I just pray that uh, even as she goes to her new assignment, that she can do so knowing that you will go before her you will be with her and that you will use her life in a very special way as she seeks not only to serve our country but lord to come to know you in a deeper way in days ahead i thank you for young adults who who are on mission in so many ways today for these uh, students that sit before me every week uh, for the young people that are giving their lives in service and in ministry and i just pray that uh, they will come to know the, the fulfillment adam has talked about how the joy and the, the, the excitement in life comes from knowing you and fellowshipping with you. We give you praise today for the service, for the, the challenge Adam has given us. Lord, for again, the way you are working in so many lives. I just pray you make us open and receptive and allow us to, to be a part of, of the kingdom work that's going on all about us. Now, thank you for lunch, for those who prepared it for us. Give us good fellowship as we share together, as we enjoy good food. Bless it to our bodies. But Lord, more especially, give us the desire to give ourselves fully to your kingdom and to your glory. We love you. We thank you. We give you praise today in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Take time to greet one another and let's go. We're going to sing.